Thank you all very much for joining us in person and online. Um, we're really excited to have uh, yours with us this evening. Um, I, I will maybe introduce Joris and also the lecture series um, and then hand over to, uh, to Joris to present some thoughts and images and then we can have a discussion. Um, so this lecture series is called uh, Experiments in Imagining Otherwise. Um, it's titled after uh, Lola Olufemi's book. Um, Lola's book is grounded in black feminist thought and community organizing. It's a really fantastic uh, piece of work, so we recommend you all uh, have a look at it. Um, and it really kind of asks us to imagine um, transformative ways of relating to one another um, and the possibilities of living otherwise. So, um, this lecture series uh, reinforces uh, and values embodied knowledge. We've invited um, a really, well, we have a really great lineup. <laughs> and we've invited some uh, practitioners, uh, facilitators, artists, and makers. Uh, who are going to join us over the coming weeks. Um, we're going to explore themes of uh, indigenous knowledge systems, um, uh, decarbonization, uh, racial justice, and gender. Um, and we're very excited to kick off today with Yoris. Um, so it was, the series was organized uh, by um, Merve, uh, Bushra, Nana, and myself. Uh, we're tutors in the diploma school, and our units have very similar themes, or explore uh, very similar themes. And uh, we're all very big fans of yours, and so uh, we were very excited when he accepted the invitation uh, for this evening. Um, yours is a trainer uh, in anti-racism, bias, uh, privilege, and decoloniality. Uh, he draws from his own experience uh, as a person who identifies with various marginalized identities. And these are in the inter at the intersection of race, uh, sexuality, um, and new, uh, neurodivergence. Um, so he combines the pract his practice in sociology with his background in architecture uh, to facilitate workshops, uh, create content and strategies that tackle the topics of systemic inequalities, bias and uh, decolonization. He's mostly active on TikTok and Instagram, so pick up your phones and follow him. <laughs> Um, and uh, his content reveals how our built environment reflects and often reinforces uh, the power structures and hierarchies uh, prevalent in our society. Um, so I think that's it from me. I don't know if Bushra or Nana uh, or Murray want to add anything. No, I think so. I'm good. Sadly, Nana is not with us today because she's on a research trip. Yeah. Um, but uh, she'll join the rest. And she sends she sends her love. So I think it's uh, over to you, Yoris. My turn. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, so do you oh, want to? Which one do I use? This. This. Whichever you prefer. Mm. I don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. So. You've already introduced um, in most, but yeah, so just wanted to, um, to add that I'm a failed architecture student, so I, I did study architecture, but, um, but then, yeah, branched out for many different reasons, um, including s some of which have to do with, with my marginalized identities as well, but I didn't know that at the time. So yeah, if you fail, if there are any students in the room, you can fail and then end up a few years later, um, giving lectures in an <laughs> architecture school. So yeah. Um, so now, I 
most of my work would fall into sociology, even though I do not claim to have a sociology background. But this is what I do in, in, as a trainer and also in, in my content. Um, but it's quite recently, a year and a half ago, that I found the angle where I could mix um, sociology and, and architecture um, and using my own experiences um, and some the, the analytical framework of decolonization, decoloniality to um, talk about buildings. And what I like to do is, um, especially on the topic of colonization and decolonization, decoloniality, we immediately if, if we're in London, if we're in the UK, we immediately think about the colonized world overseas, but I like to think about and, and try to find hints or traces or complete, very obvious um, forms of, of colonization that ha are applied to us people living, living in London, living in the UK. Um, so even if Colonization is definitely something that happened uh, in in the colonized world, but we can see traces of it, traces of the mentality, the mindset that led to it. We can see its its traces in in the way that we organize our society here, or the way that society is organized, and in our built environment. So, I will start with. Let's not do that joke of spilling the tea over the laptop. And so there's, um, this is where it all started in Vauxhall, um, which is a place that I frequent re regularly, um, the gym more specifically. And um, this, I was always um, intrigued by, by, by this building and more specifically the green spaces of, um, so that, that development is St. George's Wharf and it's right along the Thames. Uh, but what, what I find very interesting and so clear here is that those spaces, those green spaces, are not really designed for people to, to occupy, to enjoy. It's not for, for the for usage. They, so they have um, different functions, one of which is um, act as a buffer. Um, because so all of the development is is private private land, uh, but part of it are open to the public, so they're accessible to the public, and part of it are not accessible to the public. They are specifically for the residents. Um, and there's an, another type of space which is not even physically accessible to anyone. And here, what we see here is. Um, basically a glorified um, car ramp for, for the hotel. Um, so we see here that it's, it's a sort of circle that goes under the building, uh, but on both sides you can see that there's some greenery, which is nice, it's good. We are, we are in favor of greenery here, um, but it's, it's, not, it's not meant for anyone to, to, to enjoy. The height makes it inaccessible, and it is quite clear that it's it's yeah it's it's just basically a car ramp. Um, you can see this here. So, in terms of architecture, is is this good space? I mean, it looks nice. We can see the curves and stuff. So, if you're into postmodernism, um, that would be that might be your your thing. And here. Let, let, I want to make it clear that I'm not criticizing the aesthetic of it, but I am analyzing its function and how we are actually using space or wasting space um, in, in a city that lacks space. Um, there's this, 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 this kind of non-places um, that because they are green, because they've got bushes and, and vegetation, then it, they, they get away with, um, with being non-usable, basically. So, yeah, example. So we see here again, it's not ugly, but it's empty, it's lifeless, it's soulless. Um, so those spaces, they, they, they just, they are here to increase the, the prices of the properties around it because it's, of course, if you can sell, if you have a flat that overlooks um, a garden, then of course your property goes up. But that garden in itself was never conceived with 
real concern about um, enjoyment, about aesthetic in mind. It's just purely there to act as a buffer. And also, um, the last point is that it acts as a, a marker of social status. Because by creating a clear barrier between what is for the public and what is for the use, the exclusive use of the residents, by making it clear with those barriers um, and with some signs, I believe I took a picture, but yeah, residents only. Um, because no residents basically use that space. It's not really for them to enjoy, but it's mostly to send a signal to whoever walks past that this isn't for you, this is for the people, this is for the people who are worthy of it, the, the people who can afford living here. So again, it's not about the aesthetic, although the fact that it's so clearly not really beautiful, that enhances the, 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 the message here, which is, that enhances the, 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 the function, the symbol. It's, it's, it's a symbolic function, which is to clearly create a segregation between the residents, those who can afford to live here, and, and the non-residents. And so this is the kind of message that we don't necessarily consciously perceive as violence, but I posit that this is a form of violence, this is a form of structural violence, because in, we are impeded in our way, in, in the way that we move, in a space that is designed to supposedly be public, but that constantly reminds us that it's a private space, it is owned by someone, so our presence is merely tolerated. And these kind of signs, um, coupled with things like barriers like that, they're here to remind us that we this this place we barely belong here or at least this is this is the message and this is a structure that so it reinforces social structures um, by really making it clear there's the residents and there's the peasants um, and it's even more clear and egregious because the space in itself is not even worth it it's not even a beautiful space because the argument would be well the residents pay extra for that so they have every right to have a garden they're paying for it Yes, but that garden is not even nice, and that's that's the whole point of it. It's purely symbolic. Um, so, and as you can see, that barrier it's also purely symbolic because if you want to get in, you get in. Uh, so it's also it's yeah it's it's almost comical because we we we're working with symbols here. Um, so you can see the inside, um, absolutely empty, absolutely nothing, nothing interesting. It's just benches, um, but yeah, nothing's happening, nothing is being said. And so that's an external bench, so that's just on the other side. So here I'm allowed to be, over there I wouldn't be allowed to be. Um, so again, just, just to give you some context, an idea of the architecture, and it's in the middle of a, um, one of the areas that is the most ferociously, ferociously um, re redeveloped in London. Um, high rises, there's a, there's a lack, of, lack of housing in London, and what we're building is luxury high rises that do not address any of the problems um, of Londoners. Um, but it's a nice place to stack your money if you're a millionaire, so really nice. Um, and here, so again, that's so the development that I'm talking about is St George's Wharf, which was built, I believe, in the 80s or 90s, uh, and all and the high rises around it that's still being built now. So two different periods here, but, but, but we can see that, um, yes, now it's become even more uh, prime real estate, this area, so being redeveloped. And yeah, here we see, so this is the, the, the banks of the Thames, and we see that underneath it, it's, it's a park, park place, so there's, yeah, even, yeah, even the ground is not real. Um, so this, yeah, an idea of the, the architecture. Again, we may like it or not like it, but the, the question here is not necessarily aesthetic, it's more the symbols that are and the messages that this space is sending to the people who walk through it. And here we can see that there's a fair amount of greenery, um, but again, purely symbolic. It's not really for anyone's use. 
um, not, not, not the passers-by, and not even the residents, because it's not made, made for that. And more barriers, another type of barrier, and you see the fountain in the background, obviously empty. Um, I think I've always known it empty, but um, yeah, so again, more symbols, uh, more added value for, for the property when, when they're being sold, but what does that actually do? Is it actually a nice space? No, because that was never the priority, that was never the goal. It was not designed to be beautiful, it was designed to add value to the properties and to create a social segregation or to reinforce a visible social segregation. Um, residents only, again, as you can see on the sign, St. George's Wharf, residents only, and yeah, so that's the St. George's Wharf. Um, I did a video last year about that, and it was uh, picked by Ben Shapiro, who is um, a uh, famous uh, right-wing uh, American commentator, whatever he does. Um, but that was that was interesting. Um, sent me a lot of a lot of hate. But it, it, had my limit of glory thanks to um, the far right, Ben Shapiro. But it was very interesting because. Of course, the kind of pushback that I get is very useful to, because that gives me tool to then address in the rest of my work to address the, 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 the talking points and the, the, the kind of um, attacks. And here, it's intentionally in the video that I made about St. George's Wharf, um, he interpreted it, he twisted it in a way that um, to make it look like I had something against private property and that just the mere fact that it was private property and that I couldn't own it, that was a form of violence, which was never my point. My point was that it was intentionally, symbolically asserting a separation uh, and a class and separation. So, and that's why it's violent, because it's keeping you out. It's reminding you, you don't belong here. Um, and you might recognize this place, um, but there's actually a very good example of exactly the same thing just out, outside of this building. Um, and this is Bedford Square. And again, just like St. George's Wharf, but probably even more in, in an even more obvious way, this is a space in central London that really, we, central London has very little green space um, and lacks public space and we have this, which is not accessible to the public. So it stays empty for most of the year and well, if you're students here, you, chances are you get to enjoy it and you might have been, been there, but it's still not for for the, the public use and it's not answering any of the, the needs of people who might be around here, um, workers, um, residents, but I'm not too worried about the residents of the square. I mean, they, they have access to it, but if you can afford living in Bloomsbury anyway, I'm sure I'm sure you're fine. But, um, but yeah, also the workers or people who live in central London could use um, a nice park for their lunch break, um, but that's, that is denied to Londoners. And fences, fences, again, those we don't necessarily or very often think about the message of the fence and the violence that it exerts, but creating a space, reminding you that you belong outside and not inside, all of those are messages that we internalize and in, in a city that relies so heavily on, on those, those social structures, that ends up having an effect on how, we, how comfortable we feel and whether or not we call this city home. As a French person, for me, the notion of, of, of parks that would not be available to, that would not be accessible to the public is completely, completely alien to me. If you add to that the fact that I'm a person of color um, and that navigating spaces is already trickier, um, a queer person as well, all of those identities make it more likely to experience the space um, in a way that, that, and that make us particularly receptive to symbols like this, to symbols that remind us that we're not 
we don't belong here or if we're tolerated here it's merely as guests um, but there's also the message that you will never be able to own the place or to feel like you belong to, to the place um, so the notion of property as well so here you have the whole um, list of, of uh, rules for, for Bedford Square um, um, I didn't bother to read them and it, that's not the point but the point that there's such a long list of rules for a, a natural space for nature to access nature um, is already is already something that we can we have to think about. I'm not here to say revolution tomorrow, but we have to be aware that those have effects on us, on on, on people, on humans, and that also affects the way that we we move through the space, but we also relate to to the space, to society. They, those are messages that society in general sends to us, and we receive them, whether consciously or subconsciously. We receive them, and that they have an effect on 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 us. Um, so here it was important, me opening the door, because I think that um, this is having a marginalized body in a space that was not designed for him, or that was initially designed to keep him away, or people like me away. I think that it was an important symbol to have the visitor um, lanyard and, and to be able to walk into the space. I was there totally legally. Thank you very much uh, for um, allowing me to, to, to get inside. But um, yeah, it was, it's, for someone like me who's experienced being reject, rejected from spaces, or if, even if not openly rejected, but being made to feel uncomfortable in spaces, um, it is, that, that, that is a symbol that means a lot to me. So I enjoyed it, I appreciated it. Um, so this is the inside of this, this park, uh, for those who've never been, uh, not much happening, but it's green, it's a nice lawn, so it's something that the public could really enjoy, um, and it's mostly empty. I was surprised that there were two people when, when, we, when we got in the other day, um, and uh, there was another person uh, who was uh, walking their dog later on. Which is which is nice, but again, this could be for all, and it's intentionally made not to be. It was designed as such, and it's kept that way, even though the entire area has completely changed. It was mostly residential. I doubt that many people now live on Bedford Square, uh, <coughs> mostly offices, institutions. Um, but that the privacy of the park and its exclusiveness and exclusionarity and um, made up that word um, but the fact that it's exclu exclusive and exclusionary um, that hasn't changed throughout throughout the, the centuries so there's um, so this the way that it was designed it was designed um, to be a reflection of, of, of the upper upper class, the upper society of the time. Um, and that society, that mentality, that relies so heavily on a very, um, very strong structure and, and class divide, that has consequences as well. The fact that, so this is a representation of how they envisaged the space and how they built the city. And that mentality, had also um, influences all over the world um, that that relied on such a heavy um, social social divide, social segregation, and the existence of an upper class, and that is so dependent on the physical separation from other classes. That is not. That is not something that is that every society has produced, but that's something that specifically British society has produced. And as a result, we, it's not a coincidence if in this area we have uh, institutions that are particularly significant in the, in the colonial project, in the history of colonization. Um, it's not a coincidence if that mentality has birthed 
um, those the, those places and and that that structure, political structure. So we have, for instance, SOAS, um, which initially so that stands for the School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, Again, at the time of its inception, that was entirely a tool of, of oppression and, and colonization, uh, with the, the idea was that the knowledge is here, and we get to observe, we get to study the other, the other being the savage in Africa and in Asia. Um, so that was the idea, um, observing, studying, but with this notion that there's, um, yeah, the knowledge is in this area. The power, the knowledge, Bloomsbury, um, is, 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 was conceived as the center of that. So this is SOAS. Uh, don't look in my face, but it's the uh, British Museum. I don't think I need to spend much time um, talking or explaining the, um, the colonial implications of the British Museum. Um, and it's not a coincidence if it's in this area too. And, um, and we have this, this institution that we're in. Um, so I call it an institution because, well, yeah, it is. It is one as, as well, and and it also has uh, it's a role to play in in the in the history and the mindset of colonization of British colonization, um, and I believe that it's not a coincidence if um, it's in this school that was coined the the, the concept of uh, of tropical modernism, and which again relies on this idea that this is going to be the West, the Europeans observing, studying, and bringing the knowledge to, to people, to the colonized world, um, bringing the knowledge, the savoir-faire, the technique, the technology, as if that did not exist, that was not already present there. So um, again, it's a, a one-way street. And, and having the institutional arrogance to think that here the knowledge about other places and about the others will be produced here and applied to the other without them really having a say or we, without them having a chance to to also um, bring their knowledge and without us, well, when I say us, without the West um, absorbing the knowledge that already existed, that is one of the, uh, an example of, of the, the colonial project and how that impacts um, impacts mentalities. Um, so just to finish, yeah, um, on Bedford Square, this is, um, that was the other day, so maybe one of you is here on this photo. Um, but I, I found it quite interesting because the public is, um, is relegated to, to sitting down on the asphalt when you have an absolutely gorgeous park just a few meters away, but it's not accessible. So again, what message is this sending? Um, and um, yeah, I think that it's also, it's the, the pinnacle of, of power, wealth, and luxury is the ability to own something and make no use of it. And I think that in itself is a message that is almost insulting when that thing that you own is, is in such scarcity and when people have no access to it. So whether it be money, whether it be resources, but also in a city like London, space. So owning space and clearly, visibly making no use of it, keeping it empty, that is a message. It's not, it's, it's, it says something. And many people rely on this because there's this idea that Luxury is not bad because luxury is enjoying nice things and I have no problem with enjoying nice things. I hope to have access to nice things and we should, we all, I hope that we all get access to nice things. So it's not a problem of nice things, it's the problem that this is a nice thing that is purposely kept away from everyone. And, and the power, here the message is that they're rather a space that they can't use themselves. By they, I mean the, the ruling class, the people of power. Uh, they're rather not being able to use it if that means that the peasants, the underclass, the public is also not able to use it. So it is more important to deprive the masses from 
the goods than, than, than actually making use of it yourself if you from from the perspective of, of the, the Victorian um, upper class but my point is that that hasn't changed that much because we see it with St George's Wharf and we see it in what is being built today in London we still have um, buildings being built with with a rich door and a poor door um, and so that segregation is still baked into our society and that separation and that use of of uh, resources or non-use of resources, I think that it's, it's directly linked to colonization. I think that none of it is a coincidence. And I think that the colonial project shaped this city and that this city shaped the colonial project um, uh, in the British colonial project. And, and, and yeah, we have a great example of it outside and where we are here today. I think, uh, yeah, I don't know how long that was, but um, yeah. it's been yeah. 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 So, yeah, I think we're going to... You're going to have to speak yeah, in the sorry, mic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much, Joris. Um, we're going to ask you some questions, um, George, Mabe, and I now, and have a sort of discussion with you, and then we'll open the floor up to the uh, rest of the room as well. Um, okay, now I just... So, um, it was really fascinating kind of hearing about um, your... Uh, I, I guess you said it's your first, it was your first TikTok where you crossed, crossed this kind of intersection between architecture and sociology. I just wanted to ask about kind of what drove you to start using TikTok in that way and, and discussing architectural topics of the built environment in that way on TikTok. Kind of what was the impetus? Um, yeah. I think I can, yeah, yeah I can use this so that you can, well, easier. what do you prefer, which, which was, whatever, was okay, yeah, maybe, maybe. If it's uncomfortable for you to leave. Yeah, because, okay. okay. Um, so, that, that specific, that specific angle, it was sort of an accident, but it was an accident, but when I saw the, the response that I got, um, it also so happened that this was something that I really, really enjoyed doing. Um, so I continued doing it. Um, but I've so I've always I've always overanalyzed everything, overthought everything, and for most of my life, including as a as an architecture student, this was to my detriment um, because I felt that there was so much happening that I didn't know what to do with because I didn't know who would be interested in hearing those thoughts and there's always the, the pushback of, well, besides the fact that not many people care, but there's also, well, you're just, just critiquing, criticizing for the sake of it, you're very negative, etc. So that had been my experience up until then. And then suddenly when I made this, this, this video and this connection between, between architecture and sociology and how that affects all of us, suddenly people could relate to it. Um, one of the, the, the messages that I get very often is that, um, and that I enjoy the most, is when people tell me that I actually highlighted something that they've always felt, but never really were never able to put words to it and not really articulate what was happening and why they were feeling that way. But suddenly when I when I shine a line on it, a light on it, that suddenly makes sense. Uh, and this is something that I that I really that I really enjoy doing is something that you might walk past every day and you don't think anything of it, but if I off offer you a, a, a different angle or something that, that maybe was missing, suddenly it all makes sense and you, you have a completely different outlook on that very familiar thing. Um, so that's something that I really enjoy doing and when I saw that that was the unexpected result of, of that video, then I knew I wanted to continue in that direction. Sure. Um, maybe just to follow on from that, because I, I think um, what's really interesting in the way that you talk about <clears throat> these different spaces that you showed us is like this question of access and, and who has access and 
what is public space and what is private space. And it's really interesting to think of you speaking about those questions of access on TikTok, right? Which in itself is also a platform that in a way questions access and, and or maybe I'd like to hear you maybe talk more about that, that. This idea of like architectural critique becoming something that we disseminate on TikTok and, and who gets to make that critique now. Yeah, it's, um, it's, 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 it's a challenge because Obviously, the TikTok is, is considered um, the, the opposite of, of, a, of an honorable institution, uh, but, but that's, that's exactly the point. The idea is to bring to the masses and to bring where, to meet people where they're at, uh, because those, those discourses, they affect all of us. Um, so I think it's, it's important to, to communicate them in a way that, that resonates with people, because yeah, most people actually completely understand what we're talking about and what I talk about. Um, so it's intentional to break to break the, the the walls of the institution and and also talk about the institutions, but from the outside. Um, again, the, the the notion of space and where where we position ourselves, and we are very used to um, the institution or the power um, observing and studying us, the people. Um, so I think very interesting and I think that that's what I enjoy about TikTok is from that external perspective, observing the, the power, the, the institutions um, and, and that's, that's a, a paradigm shift that, that sometimes, yeah, some people don't like that at all but that's, that's, that's the whole point. It shows that I'm doing something right. Mm. Oh, maybe use it. Um, I just wanted to ask: um, how, Do you do you feel affected by how people engage with the content um, on TikTok? So, um, do you think the the engagement you get or the responses affects like the content that you continue continue to produce, or do you feel like the content is sort of not, um, let's say, affected by that? Uh, the way people feedback. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it really, the feedback informs most of my work. Um, and, and funnily enough, it's mostly the negative feedback that informs my work. Um, but um, yeah, because it shows me where there's something that maybe I didn't make clear enough, or it also shows me that the areas in which I might be pushing a button or challenging a structure that does not want to be disturbed. Uh, so that indicates that I should do more work in that direction, not just to be annoying, although that's a, being annoying to um, far right uh, people such as Ben Shapiro, that I do enjoy that very much. Uh, but it's not just the only point, but it's also because I believe that in the current situation, there are certain people who benefit from the, ma the masses, the people not understanding exactly what uh, the, the real nature of the discourse is, but also the way that they are being affected by it. Um, so I think very important to really address that. So when there's something that is not understood, I take it as, as very valuable information because that means I need to work more on, on talking about that, on making it explicit, on, on making it accessible to more people because if we, I believe if we all had the analytical framework um, to understand how we are being affected by our society, then we would probably, there would be a sense of, of, of community and a sense of common interest, um, much more than there is at the moment. So yes, um, that's so yeah, it definitely informs uh, my work, the feedback. I think I, like, it's, it's clear that the kind of uh, current forms of knowledge production are marginalized large, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, yeah, actually marginalize entire communities. And I think like it's very inherent in, um, there's an inherent power dynamic in places of learning like this one. 
And I think what's really interesting about your work is that you are creating these kind of spaces, whether online or, or in these, uh, or as a facilitator, um, which uh, which is really which are informal spaces of learning and knowledge exchange. And in a way, I'm, I have maybe two questions to ask here because I'm curious also about uh, why you left architecture school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I also maybe want to recognize that, like the, uh, the the measure of formal education as like qualifying exists as a way to classify, mm -hmm. and in a way, it's very much uh, very much upholds these kind of colonial structures. And I think it's uh, it's in, it's it's obviously you know it's it's designed to be inaccessible, and. I guess maybe this is two, two questions. One, can you talk a bit more about um, your experience uh, in, you know, in studying architecture and uh, qualifying as, a, as an architect, and, and also how, uh, how you bring that experience into the spaces of learning that you facilitate today? If that's clear. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably go on tangents anyway Good. and forget what the question was, but feel free to bring me back uh, into if, if I don't fully answer. Uh, so my experience of um, studying architecture, um, well, many reasons, but um, one of the reasons is that I now know that I'm neurodivergent, so I have ADHD, I'm on the autistic spectrum, and um, now, I have much more, more tools to find accommodations and understand what works for me and what does not. But at the time, um, I just felt like a failure and I, I just didn't understand why I seemed to struggle uh, and I seemed to be facing barriers that my colleagues um, were not facing. They were not, didn't seem to have the same kind of difficulties. Um, so I just internalized that I was probably just not good, um, lazy, um, I could never, meet a deadline, uh, I was always um, the last one showing up um, and yeah, I remember vividly one of my teacher, teachers one day uh, who was like the, star, archi the archi star architect of the school but uh, yeah at some point he was like, do you think you're above everyone here? Why are you so arrogant? Simply because I hadn't slept in days and, and I was still trying to finish my, my model in class um, instead of listening to my other colleagues presenting. But I was completely desperate. I was completely, um, yeah, like in, in the worst situation possible. And, and the fact that th I still somehow was perceived as seeing myself as superior and being arrogant when I was at my lowest and the worst of my death. Yeah, it was, it was really, I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And also because, uh, yeah, I'd, got, I'd sailed through all of my school years without having to work um, because I could just, even in secondary school, I could just turn up at my exams and without having worked too hard, without having to revise, etc. But suddenly when you get to, when I got to university and architecture school, my colleagues had learned, had acquired the, 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 the skills to, to work, to learn, um, to prepare for exams. I never had to do that because everything had been so easy for me up until then. And suddenly I found myself going from more skilled uh, and better than the, the average of my class to being at the bottom of my class. And, yeah, that was uh, not fun. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I just became, um, I just did not want to be, wanted to be, I did not want to be a student anymore. So the whole, the whole concept of being a student, um, if I could have just showed up um, at classes, sat down, taking my notes, and I would have, that would have been great, but, but you had the, the whole, yeah, that, uh, it was just too much for me. So I ended up leaving um, the, studying architecture also because of all the internalized negative messages and I thought that I was a failure. If things were to happen now, it would be very different. So um, yeah, I think I would be able to enjoy it much more. Um, but yeah. And there was another question, which I'm pretty sure I haven't replied. There but was, but it's okay, you don't have to answer it. <laughs> I, just, I, I, yeah, I don't want to take too much space, but I, I think it's really powerful what you're saying, because in a way, it just like, you know, you, uh, 
you acknowledge that there is so much knowledge in being rather than doing and I think there is so much actually it's very difficult for a lot of us to to get to that point um, and I think it's a constant kind of uh, dialogue um, yeah, yeah. Not really a question, but I, well, now I remember I what I wanted to say about your your other question um, about well, so one the, the struggles that I faced, I think that it just so happens that most of them would be resolved if the institution that I was studying at was more of a decolonized space, uh, even though I'm not blaming colonization for my failures as a student. But now that I'm in a position of teaching teachers how to decolonize, and funnily enough, I mentioned SOAS in, in my presentation, SOAS is one of the institutions that I regularly work with and I, that I give trainings and workshops to um, the teachers to, um, well, educate them on anti-racism, bias, privilege, and help them decolonize their, their, their curriculum. So now, now I'm in the opposite position, and now that I'm in that position of teaching, I also know that if that had been applied, the, the, the principles that I teach and this idea of leaving aside this completely vertical notion of, you know, you here, there's the teacher, there's the student, and the student receives the knowledge. Um, absolutely no, yeah, everything is vertical. And so I, I know that now that I know how to deconstruct that, or at least I can guide people, because I'm not a teacher, I don't claim to be a teacher, but I can help people and teachers ask themselves the right questions if they want to, um, to change their their, 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 their teaching, their pedagogy, and, and their, also their environment, the, the teaching environment. So now that I know that, I also can see how that negatively affected me, how the colonial structures and this very imposing, rigid structure that is the institution and the teaching of architecture, at least at the time, how that affected me, and yeah. Hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing, because I think that a lot of that resonates with us as like former students, um, current practitioners, teachers. When you were saying like, um, you know, had it been now, it would have been different. Um, so like more and more we're seeing um, groups proliferating, either using kind of online platforms like yourself, or you know, you have, I don't know, Dan Boyd writes like the most famous example, but you know, more and more kind of yeah, on like platforms, groups like um, Future Architects Front, there's a kind of decentralization of um, gatekeepers of that architectural knowledge, or you know, it doesn't have to be architecture, but in any discipline, there are more voices um, being heard, and I think all of us feel like it's very different now to when we were studying. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the role of, again, TikTok, but generally social media has been in that? I would say maybe, um it it opens the walls of, of the institution of of the yeah this 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 notion that there are sacred spaces um, I mean them being sacred is a good thing but um, the rigidity of of and because spaces that are rigid that uh, assert assert power over over people over their student and who gatekeep the knowledge that's also that, that's how they maintain a certain structure of power um, so by challenging that we are well atomizing the the places of knowledge but also we are um, challenging the the verticality of, of this idea that knowledge is all in one place and then everybody else receives and shuts up and and um, so that creates an, an environment that is more uh, open to co-creation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that architects in particular, or the job of architecture is very, um, it's at the core of this, and it's one of those, the, the, I would say the prof one of the professions that needs it the most because there is, I, I've used that term earlier, but th there is an institutional arrogance that is attached to 
architecture because there's this knowledge, at least I don't know how it is now, and I, I'm sure that you try to counter that, but when I was a, <laughs> when I was a student, uh, there was this notion that the architects knows best, and there was absolutely no time spent teaching us how to listen to people, how to, because we're building for others, mm -hmm. but there was, that was never really a part of the equation, how to listen to people, how to be attuned to their needs, how to materialize what they want, what they need, and especially if that, and there was no time spent teaching us to be okay with the needs of the others being different from what we would want for ourselves. Um, so there's this notion that what, what we intuitively know and what works for us would work for the other ones. We have the knowledge, we're the architects, so they, they can just shut up and we will tell them. Uh, so. They, I don't remember where I was going with that, but uh, so I think that yes, architecture more specifically is a, a, a domain that that really should or would benefit from from the the decolonization of of, of the, the the space and the knowledge production and teaching. Um. I wanted to just touch on something you mentioned earlier, which is about uh, this area we are in now in Bloomsbury being the kind of center of knowledge and, and somewhere that holds power and knowledge. And um, I wondered if, <laughs> I mean, it's maybe quite a broad question, but how can we start to um, have like a true exchange and um, perhaps with kind of if we think maybe about like places like the Global South and the Global North, for example, and how can they be more of a true exchange rather than just being this place that holds knowledge that kind of disseminates to um, other places? Well, that, that is a big question. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I would say that it has to, yeah, we, we would have to decolonize the institutions, and I know that there are efforts that are being made, but but symbols like this, like the barriers, the fences of, 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 of um, the square out there, um, they just remind us that there's so much work that needs to be done. Um, and sometimes it's, it's also a matter of perception. For instance, in the in the case of of the the, the, the British Museum, mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of work that is being done, or mm -hmm. even though not enough, because they're not sending back the artifacts that they should be sending back. But there's at least some form of acknowledgement of the colonial past mm -hmm. and how that affects the institution now. Some work is being done at SOAS too, and I'm sure some work is being done here, but. It has to continue, and as for the space in itself, get rid of those fences, make it accessible to everyone, open it, and um, yeah, and also the fact that it's it's managed by by a company which I'm sure is making money somehow. So that's like you know, there's profit that is being made by the the segregation of this space. So I'm not saying that if you remove the, the, the metal fences here, then suddenly that solves the, the, the problem of, of, of the relationship global north, global south, but it's it could step. be a start. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Great. I mean should we open we should. to I to the rest? Good. Um not hog <laughs> hog the rest of ourselves. Um yeah, who wants, does anybody, okay, there we go, we've already got a question, so I'll pass the mic over. Also, if I may say, if anyone in this room have answers to the questions that have been asked, I'm more than happy to hear them. Um, again, this is a decolonized space, so there's no knowledge holder and then knowledge receiver. I'm, I'm actually very curious to hear some of the answers to some of those questions, because they're really big. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a former student, I just uh, graduated and right now happily unemployed. And um, <laughs> I'm really glad that you came here and, uh, and just uh, was able to criticize Bedford Square, but also the institution itself. Being here, usually we tend to fetishize ourselves and the role of our own school in the colonial project is something that we don't really touch upon. 
and uh, so before I ask my question, I wanted to just <laughs> say a couple more things to give a bit of context. Um, most of us here are, I mean, come from abroad and usually come from rich families. And uh, like you were talking about Shapiro and, 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 and enjoying or uh, in, in clashing with the far right, but there's something a bit more insidious here, I feel, where uh, not talking about the right wing section of, uh, of the school, but mostly the left, the, the progressively minded uh, student and teachers that do propose projects that, uh, or even after they graduate and do that out there for real, projects that uh, can be uh, at least Maybe, at least on paper, but sometimes for real, a bit more inclusive, a bit more community driven. They are uh, avant garde ish, small firms that do work uh, of that sort, and that some of our students might even work for them at some point. But uh, and the problem is that we're totally capable of doing a, a wonderful garden project where the whole, gen the, the whole neighborhood gets gentrified, and the people who get to enjoy that garden isn't the community that got to help to build in the first place anymore. And so here I'm not talking about Bedford Square, which is at a very explicit, uh, literally gatekeeping <laughs> uh, everyone else. But, but even uh, 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 what was at the beginning a positive and inclusive project. And so my question is more, since you're here and you're addressing yourself to uh, a fairly wealthy section of the of the population. What would, what is your hope? You know, like what? Uh, in in a way, if I if I wanted to be mean, I would say you're barking the wrong tree. But, mm -hmm. but I I, uh, I I I very much relate to what you're what you're presenting and and myself like being person of color and. Mm -hmm. uh, just the difference being that I'm, I, I'm uh, part of the upper echelon. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, if, th if that makes sense. Yeah, um, well, thank you. Thank you for your question, well, or your, your comment. Um, I, I would say that I'm, I'm under no illusion that, well, you, you're right, actually. I'm, I'm barking at the wrong tree in a sense. If, if we think that I'm here to change people's minds in this room, which, no. If you're here, you probably, chances are you already agree with everything I, I was saying here today. Um, but I'm using the institution because this is a platform. Um, so this, all, all, all things considered, but like this, will, this resonates, this will, this, the space, the physical space, but, but this event that also acts as an amplifier of, of, of those thoughts. And also with the fact that I'm in an institution making a point about the, the, the colonial and racist origin and nature of this institution, that is powerful, but it's not achieving much. And, and uh, yeah, I'm fully aware of that, but I'm also very happy to, to use this as, as, as a platform because, again, the idea is to reach more people. And I know that even though this might be a limited audience, but the fact that I can say that I was here, I was in this building, in this architecture school, that gives me, and, and the people here, that gives us some, some credibility, and hopefully we can use that to then go into other spaces, not this one, because nothing is gonna be changed. Revolution is not starting from this room tonight. Um, sorry if that was the, the hope, but I mean, you're more than welcome, but I'm going to the restroom. I'll tell you later. <laughs> but yeah, so I think that yeah, this is this is we we talk a lot about echo chambers and in, in, in a negative way, but I think that echo chambers can also be a good thing. Especially we tend to forget or not talk about the importance of building a community. We live in society that tries really hard to destroy the concept of community and to replace it with, with something that we have to buy into. The problem with community is that you can't sell it. Um, so that's why the, the, this system doesn't like that. Um, but 
us being here, even though we agree with each other, it's not in vain because we are building a community and, and that is powerful because that gives us strength to go out into the world and to go into the fights that we have to fight. Now, the, the fact that this is a very, a very privileged environment, um, it is also important to acknowledge that one of the reasons why the system that we live under is lasting, has been lasting for so long, is because it's very good at pretending to offer a solution um, to the to real problems, or to morph itself, to adapt itself. I'm a trainer on anti-racism. I work with, with, with private companies, I work with mostly with universities and British universities. I am fully aware that most of the time the people who are in attendance, they're just happy to be able to tick the box of, oh, I've done anti-racism, I'm not racist anymore. I'm aware that by doing the work that I do, I sort of contribute to that. And that, in a sense, that makes things even worse because then I have to deal with people who think they're not racist because they did, a, they did the workshop. Um, but then, so it's even more difficult. So that, that has to be considered as well. And I'm, and I'm not naive and, and I try to be careful with that, to not leave people too comfortable. Um, but that's why I think very important to, to, to start with, with, um, with positionality, to acknowledge our, our privileges, our disadvantages, and also the blank spots that we all have. And that's a big part of my, my, uh, my workshops, is to get rid of universalism. That's bullshit, does not exist. Get rid of, of objectivity, that's not a thing. Everything is subjective, our perception of the world, of our society, of ourselves, is going to be influenced by, by, by our experience, by our identities. We all have biases, we all are racist, sexist, etc. because of all, we are part of a society, so how could we not be in, impacted by the implicit messages of our society? So, yeah, let's not kid ourselves. Um, but I think, yeah, very important to, to, to keep in mind that, and, and this is what I try to focus my work on, is to make people realize that their perception is subjective. And that's okay, there's nothing wrong with being subjective, but we have to remember that other people have, they can, their truth might be true as well. Um, because usually when there is one universal truth, it's the truth of the, the dominant group. It's the truth of the powerful, of the privileged. So I try to get rid of that, even though I know that my workshops or my TikTok videos are not going to get rid of racism and other structures of oppression. Just to add on that, I just wanted to say, I think there's also something really um, powerful and strong about taking space um, and I think this is what some of the intention we had, um, four of us, of this lecture series is to just take some space and to talk about these co this content or the subject matter that doesn't always get addressed or talked about um, beyond our, you know, closed social circle, let's say. Um, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Oh, thank you. Um, thanks, Joris. That was such an insightful lecture. I'm sure we can all agree that it was kind of like a eureka moment of like, oh, we see these things the whole day, but actually there's more to them. And now when I see events, I'm like, that's violent. Um, <laughs> no. But <laughs> I have two questions. But the second one's just a mini question. Well, the second question is, who's the coolest person who follows you on TikTok? But like, <laughs> save that for the, the bigger question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> so I'm not from an architectural background. I do something totally different. But this made me think about an incident that happened to me last summer. Now, I'm just going to provide a bit of context, because there's a greater question here. I was on a run in a, um, an open space. This space is, it used to be a mine, and then this mine was flooded, and then it became a site of special scientific interest. So there's like migrating birds, it's just beautiful lakes, but it's surrounded all by A roads and council houses. So it's really the kind of the only green space for like miles in like a very urban, urban area. Now, I've got ADHD, and I love to exercise every day. I can't sleep if I don't. 
So it was hot, I didn't have you know, an outside space of my own, so I loved to go running there and vibe out. And I was turning the corner and this man was trying to stop me and I was like, oh, this can't be about me, like, but there was no one else around. And he basically was like, you can't run here. And I was like, oh, what? I, we're like under the blue sky. Like, is that a thing? Is that, have I missed something here? Like, we're on God's green. That's green a earth. sign, no running. Yeah. <laughs> and like, but I, I would always get in trouble because I would be, there would be rules, but I wouldn't like perceive there being rules. So I, I, it wasn't like a hero moment for me. I was like, no, you're right. Like, damn. So I was like, oh, okay. I just misunderstood. He was like, look, come with me. There's a sign here that says that you can't run. And exactly like you showed, it was that like all small texts. And then one of the small texts was, oh, you can't be running here. Now, like I'm white, I'm Caucasian, like I'm gay, but I don't think I was giving gay vibes that day. I think it was probably giving like <laughs> Jim bro or something <laughs> like a neurotypical. It was it was like a, it was a flash interaction, and then like, so like, I'm just going to wrap the story up because there's a question. <laughs> the end of the story is this: basically, I then phoned my best friend to be like, oh, "Are we allowed to run outside? Like, what's happening here? I feel like I'm having a, an aneurysm." <laughs> and and then so I my first degree was in natural sciences, so I am somewhat privy to like what would affect the animals and make them sad. And um, I like, went home and like did all this research to be like, have there been like academic peer reviewed studies to say that people enjoying outside spaces is like gonna disturb migrating birds? And there was only one study and it was inconclusive and like institutions like the RSVP, which like does bird stuff, um, like they encourage runners to come around, they're paired with running groups. So basically this wasn't a thing, this wasn't a thing that you couldn't go running outside. And I was like, hang on a minute, but if I was like a 15 year old in a council house and I've been in lockdown all this time and like the one little bit of exercise and get away from my like nutty parents is to come to this like gorgeous lake and this man's telling me not to, and I just couldn't fathom why, because it wasn't like an authorization, it wasn't racism, it wasn't those things. But then I was like, it's, a, it's like a uniquely British, like it was only a British person would be doing that to say, you're not welcome here. It was like this sense of, yeah, authorization. And this is what I wanted to ask you. I know you, you say like you aren't educated uh, like formally in socialism, or, uh, those sort of ideals, but like you are emotionally astute and aware. So like, what is it about British culture, the history of Britain, that's like given people this kind of us versus them mentality, that you're not welcome, even if someone by all extents and purposes looks like them? That was a question. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much. Well, my first comment is, I need to go to that place, I need to film that, and that <laughs> a great video. Thank you very much. Yeah, where, you need to show where is that? Where is oh, that? Oh, it's a cool prep. Oh. It's called Bradbourne Lakes. It's like in a really deprived area called Battenborough, just like 20 minutes outside London. Um, <laughs> yes. That would be very interesting, yeah. I think you should star in the TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, person. Who's the coolest person to follow doing TikTok? Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Mm. Mm. I have to think about that because I have a few actually. Hank Green is not following me back and I find it very frustrating because he's commented on my videos but he doesn't, he won't follow me back anyway. <laughs> um, but no, there were some really cool people but I, yeah, I have to think about it. Now, to the, um, the, the sign, it's, it's, it, it's interesting because that was one of my um, first things that I couldn't get my head around when I moved to, to the UK. Um, I, so I come from several places, the most visible one being the Caribbean, but also the northeast of France, Strasbourg, which is in France, um, notorious for um, the, the cycling. And it very early on, it adopted very pro bicycle uh, policies. Um, so for me, cycling is is part of the urban landscape and environment and I just couldn't and I still can't understand why you in London or in other places in the UK you're not allowed to cycle in parks because it's like what well, that's that, that's what it's for. Why? Why? And and I think that is um, that, that, that's a good example of rules that just 
exists to annoy people, I would say. And there's always, yes, there's going to be the argument, in your case, the environmental argument, which doesn't hold. Like, so if you walk fast, the, the birds are going to be fine, and then suddenly if you, they're going to fly away. No, it makes no sense. And the argument of, of pedestrian safety um, is also, yes, of course, it's important to be careful. But um, I think that by having rules such as no cycling in a park, we also, so there's a rule that separates usage and people, instead of learning to coexist and co a bit, uh, share the space, there's like, you can use the space and you cannot use the space, or you can have this use of the space and not this other one. So it's, for the system, for, for the power, it's much easier to just say, well, you can't do it, just, just don't do it, instead of trying to think of ways to accommodate different needs, different usage, different accommodations. It's so much easier and also it, it, ben it, it has this added um, benefit for, 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 for the power is that it adds a little bit of, of, of oppression because it's something that you can't do. We decide that you cannot do that. Um, so even if it's not necessarily something that you needed to do, but it's still sending a message. And we go back to the symbol, the, the symbol nature, of, of the symbolic nature of, of, of those, those rules or those signs. Um, I'm not saying that they don't have, then they use less. They might have a use for it, even though, even if we disagree with it, there, there might be a use. But I really like to focus on the symbols and the message that they send. And here, the absurdity of it makes it even more symbolic, symbolically powerful that no, you're not allowed to run. And I'm pretty sure that the people who decided on that rule are not runners themselves. So because it's something that they probably don't quite understand and they don't really see what the, what the point of it is, instead of trying to think, get outside of their, their, their point of view, Again, that's part of the, the colonial mindset is assuming that centering yourself and assuming that what is good for you is good for everyone and what is not good for you should be forbidden for everyone. Um, so yeah, this, this idea that they probably didn't see the point in running or jogging or whatever. So it's so much easier and more efficient to just decide, well, no, you're not allowed to do it, rather than think of ways, okay, let me try to understand that part of the population who enjoys running. That seems very odd, but my, my job as the manager of the park or whatever that is, is to accommodate for as much as many people as possible, as many usage as possible. So that should be the, the logic, but obviously, as we can see, that, that was not the case. Um, I was just kind of wondering what you what your vision is of like a truly liberatory revolutionary architecture and whether that's possible in Britain considering how so many of the buildings and institutions are so wrapped up in colonialism and like wouldn't be around if it wasn't for slavery and imperialism um, and whether that is actually something that we should be working towards or like architect we just have to start again like do you have a vision for that and also Second part of the question, are there any examples in Britain that you've seen of like actual good architecture? Hmm. Well, so that's a question that I get quite often and I've never <coughs> answered it. <laughs> and the reason is that I don't know. I, I think that the way I work is I feel something I want to talk about it, and if, especially if that, that feeling is negative, then it's something that I'm much more likely to to be aware of. Just we all tend to be much more aware of things that affect us in a negative way than in a positive way. Um, but I'm I'm quite open about that, so I am quite comfortable in being in talking more about the negative than the positive. Um, there are things that. I enjoy, there are places that I enjoy, that I find beautiful, um, but they're not necessarily something that I would really think about. And as for um, solutions or what, what my vision would be, I don't have an answer either. All I know is that 
with the with the concepts that I try to, to, to implement this notion of, of getting rid of universality, getting focusing on trying to understand how other people's needs might be different from our needs and and, and being humble about our perspective, knowing that it's only our perspective. I think that those those I try to make it a framework that is not a solution, but I believe that if we try to apply that to whatever we do, everything that we do, remember that we have blind spots, that our perception is subjective. I think that if, in the, in the case of an architect, if the architect could keep that at the forefront of what, what they do, then they're less likely to run into the pitfalls of, of, you know, of oppressive architecture or oppressive built environment. Um, but also, that is assuming that the architect exists in a vacuum, which is obviously not the case. Um, so there's also things that you have to, to follow and the budget issues and other people that you work for. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's very idealistic. But I think that yeah, I try to focus on the framework rather than actual solutions or sharing a, a specific vision for um, a, a decolonized architecture, for instance. Uh, <clears throat> firstly, I just want to say thanks for setting up this very um, safe space. Uh, no, like not in a kind of ironic way, but um, yeah, and all the questions I thought so far have been um, really important and great. So just wanted to make sure that was said. Um, <laughs> pat yourself on the backs. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, it's, uh, I wanted to ask perhaps a more technical question about social media and, and kind of, uh, you were talking about maybe TikTok isn't quite like an institution here, but actually there, there has been conversations about, of course, the, the algorithm, whether that's Reels or, or TikTok or, or, or elsewise. Um, and I just wondered whether, firstly, you can describe uh, whether you've noticed personally any shifts in the algorithm, you know, this idea that obviously TikTok is content, pushing content democratically. Um, and, and how you see perhaps your own agency uh, within what I assume is, is still some form of institution, right? Like, and how can, how can we kind of, we and, and you and us, navigate um, some of these kind of digital systems? Right, well, so I will not answer your question. <laughs> and that will, be, that will be the answer, basically. But let's say that things have happened with my content and let's say social media in general that have reminded me that they have the power to wipe out my entire platform. So I've had to make a choice between fighting for what I believe is right but taking the risk of no longer having a platform or try to continue to do what I enjoy doing being in touch with people, but that would also mean putting aside a certain aspect of my work or my discourse. Um, so yes, I will, that's all I'm going to say, uh, but maybe about the algorithm in general, and that applies to all algorithms that, that, we, that surround us, and not necessarily just, just social media, but algorithms are only as, unbiased as the people who make them, and because they are biased, then we end up with algorithm that not only perpetuates the inequalities and biases of our society, but in many occasions amplify them. And I am very concerned about that because there is absolutely no oversight. We have no power on that. We don't vote for the spaces that we have increasingly no choice to exist in. Um, and those spaces work really, really hard to make themselves um, unavoidable. They try to become like the new public space, but they're not public space. And it's we, we have the equivalent with, with architecture, with spaces that are private, but that are trying to entice you into using it as if it was public, but they benefit from it. One London, for instance, where the old London City Hall is, um, 
the whole of Canary Wharf, um, it's private land, so, um, and, and of, or the example of an Apple store, any Apple store, they, they, des they designed and intended as a public forum and a city hall, but it's under the control of, of, of a giant company. So what are the consequences for us as humans, as citizens? Um, that's something that we don't get to discuss because we don't vote. Mm. We don't vote for the CEO of Apple. We don't vote for the CEO of YouTube, uh, Google, Alphabet, all of that. Um, so I'm very concerned about it. I don't have solutions, but I am in yeah, first line to experience that kind of, and I'm very privileged in that because I, have, I do have a platform. But that also means that I have to be very careful now. I've learned that the hard way. We have another lecture in the series that we'll be covering. <laughs> or we'll be talking about that with uh, Esme from DARE. Um, yeah, we'll leave that to another day. Hello. Hello. <coughs> Thank you very much for your lecture, Joris. As always, it's amazing. Um, I just wanted to add something, because you invited us to add something. Yes. Because you were speaking about projects of architecture that potentially would break the cycle that we have of perpetuating, you know, capitalism and colonialism and, ex and exclusion from a perspective of class. There's this um, project that I found really fascinating in Bordeaux, which won a prize. Uh, because there was, in the city of Bordeaux, in the 1960s, in the post-war period, they built this gigantic 16, 16 uh, uh, floor blocks that were in a really high place in the city. But because it was one of those brutalist buildings, it was quite cramped. There was a lot of people who lived, there were a lot of people who were from um, diverse backgrounds that were discriminated against or that were, you know, like from a class perspective, they were not the people who respectably lived in the city. And then the council decided to just renovate the building and just kind of tear it down. But instead of tearing it down, there's a group of architects that have a small company that decided to do something really cheap, which was to maintain the building. But they added, because each of those buildings was built in you know, like that brutalist way in which you have an island building and then lots of space around it, and then another building and lots of space around it. So they added like three meters around the facade. They had three meters, like a winter garden, in which they put like a glass facade. And then all of those buildings that were really cramped, inward looking, and all of a sudden had the best views in the city because it was on top of the hill, so you could see everything around. And instead of you know like repossessing the buildings and selling it to the highest bidder, because all of a sudden those buildings became you know, gigantic buildings with uh, prestige views and so on and so forth. Uh, the people who actually already lived there, who were kind of considered to be kind of a more of an underclass of the society of Bordeaux, started having houses that had light, that had space, oh, yeah. that allowed kids to be able to, you know, like play in those winter gardens and the life of the um, the life of those people just changed entirely. And if we were able to do more stuff like that, which pres preserves the center of the building, reinforces it, doesn't cost more cement, doesn't cost and allows the local community that exists there to continue to live there instead of, being, of it being broken apart, potentially that could be one of the millions of solutions that I'm sure mm -hmm. could. Well, thank you. Um, what I can say about it, and maybe you, you might, if you have any knowledge, uh, yeah, feel free to, to add something. But those architects, like at Tom Vassal, I, when I was a student, I, yeah, we had to study one of their projects. It was, um, I think it was a family house, so it wasn't that. But I remember that, yeah, it was explained to us already that, yeah, they, they quite known for being able to build cheap and and you know sustainable and reasonable and I remember at the time I found that boring. <laughs> I, I was not interested in that at all. Um, so that's also interesting because yeah that's and I don't know maybe there's because I don't really um, 
very often we think that oh, those, those are the good ones, they're good people, but then you, it turns out that yeah, they're problematic as fuck. Right? So I don't know about I'm not saying they're not, I'm not saying they are. I, I don't know, maybe you might have something to, to add to that. <laughs> but, um, but, but the fact that at least they were known for building cheap stuff and, and for, for the people, at the time, I found that boring, and I'm sure that that's probably the case of the majority of, of people who get into architecture. That's not what they want to hear. That's not what they care about. They want to build great, like shiny skyscrapers. I mean, I'd imagine at the beginning, hopefully, by the end of, of studying architecture, you're no longer into that. But you know, that's what we we see as like the star architects of, of our days, and so yeah. I have a follow-up question, but completely uh, on a tangent. Um, I wanted to ask what you thought. <laughs> Again, a big, big question, but uh, how you think ex-colonies or um, countries that were perhaps British or French colonies should deal with their <laughs> colonial heritage? Mm -hmm. And yes, I am asking a five to eight. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Right. Um, well, that's a, yeah, that's that's a big question um, because we had conversations earlier. And full disclosure, I we had this conversation in the room. Yeah, in the gallery. <laughs> yeah, and I think I still need a conclusive answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what? It's. I think that, well, yeah, so the term um, tropical modernism, I did not know this term until one of you brought it up to me a few days ago. Um, I knew the concept, but there's the, the specific term um, behind it, I, I was not aware of it. Um, but uh, the, the context, I think that what, is, what particularly fascinates me about it is that it's not just um, the, the white man imposing its style and architecture onto onto the colonized or deep of the world in the process of being decolonized, but it's also it's it says a lot about internalized colonization because in that in that instance, um, well, the, the, the the buildings that that you teach about, um, this it, it's those were the head of states of the newly independent countries that chose to apply that and because that was the message that they wanted to send to the world is we can be as good as the Europeans, we can do modernism just as well as opposed to we have our own values and cultures and methods and, and our own understanding of what it is to build a society, how, what it is to be a state. Instead of that, the, the, the priority was given to let's be as good or let's pretend to be just like the European countries. Um, and we see the results. Um, are those countries now decolonized? I would argue that they're not, because partly because of that internalized, mostly because we still live in a, in a society that oppresses them uh, and that exploits them, so I'm not saying it's, it's their fault, but there is an aspect of internalized colonization um, that, and I don't remember what your question was, I might not have answered it at all. Um, <laughs> how you think they should, risk, what, what they should do with that built colonial heritage, or should they do some project like this where they're, you know, um, engage with it and we turn it into something new or demolish or just keep it as it is? As, yeah. Well, so this is a good opportunity for me to acknowledge my positionality because I am not from Africa and I don't come from from an African society. I mean, I'm Caribbean, so I'm Afro-Caribbean. You can tell that at some point there, there's some Africa in, in me, um, but culturally, it's not something that I can speak on. My opinion is that it doesn't make sense to me that you know, African countries have made the decision to keep the borders from, from the, the Berlin Conference and, and that completely disrespect the pre-existing um, cultural groups that existed and the social structures that existed before colonization. I think it's a shame, but it's not, it's not my point to make, and, and also there are many other reasons why it is probably they have chosen to, to keep it that way, and it might not be even possible. So, so 
because when you ask me that question, I'm very tempted to say, well, I think that they should build, they probably not demolish it uh, because they, they exist and they, they have their function and they have something to say, but I would imagine in an ideal world, I would want to build the equivalent, but that is much more um, relevant to the cultural context and the local context, climatic context, and yeah, like a um, liberated version of what it is to build a governmental building, what it is to build a parliament, if we, with in mind, how can we create something that is really ours? But again, that's not for me to say, and I know, like, can give the example of, of Brasilia, um, because that's what they thought they were doing um, when they created the, the, this capital city out of, out of nothing. They really thought, well, it was, the intention was to both create a, a national identity, but also create a representation of that identity all at once by building this city. But when we look at it now, we realize how, how much of a product of its time and of its colonized time it is, even though at the time they were thinking that they were doing, they were doing Brazil. But no, they were, they were doing segregation, they were doing colonization, etc. And you can see it in, in the building now. So I think, yeah, I have no answer. That was a long way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I say something? Or, oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was about to say uh, yeah, the view, point of view from like a colony country. I'm from Vietnam. And yeah, it's exactly what you just asked. Because uh, from my perspective, like, I used to, because when the French was there, they created like a style called Indochine. Mm -hmm. So it's nice. I mean, I'm not sure like why, but the architecturally, spatially, it's nice. Uh, so I was like really like obsessed with that style and all the kind of thing. And then one day, my my partner just criticized me like, "Do you think you kind of like celebrated and kind of like sending all the signal like uh, because before um, those buildings like big ones only be used by like governmental like purposes. So like it's not really like." that observed by the public or tourists. But now like all the small villas like started to like turn into like cafes or restaurants, very trendy. So like a lot of tourists went there, it start to like raise the question of like, are we like trying to like impose a message that we love this style, we love the time that we both were colonized. So then I suddenly like, I, I still cannot, think of a solution for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, like demolishing it is not an option uh, for me. Um, and the easy way is just to put um, a sign to say all the history and like about this place, which is mm, not, a, it's just an easy way out. So I just, yeah, bring it up here for you guys to know that we also struggle with like this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I think that brings up a very interesting point as well, is that we can appreciate something and still be aware of its context, where it comes from, what it was intended as. Um, very often we run into, when, when we're in like a debate space, um, it's very quickly, it's like, oh, well, we're not allowed to like this or that now. Um, you want to cancel this or that. And that's not, that's not what it's about. We can do both. We can appreciate something. We can find it beautiful, but also, important, we can acknowledge where it comes from, what, what it was for. I make a lot of content about high rises, um, and I basically say how that's a, tele, that's a solution for absolutely none of the problems that they claim to solve, and, and it's, it, it just amplifies um, gentrification, etc. Well, it's, it's terrible. But fun fact, I do find them beautiful. The reason why one of the first pictures of my presentation that was the, the, the tall buildings at Vauxhall, I, I like it. I like to see them. But I also know what they represent, what, what they're here for. Um, 
it's an exercise that I don't find that complicated to, to, to have, accepting that we may find something beautiful, but also understand and criticize the, the reasons why it exists in the way that it does. And I think that, that that's what your, your, your experience and your example reminds me, because yeah, you also ask yourself the question, are you allowed to find it beautiful? Are you allowed to like it? Yeah. And, and I think you should be. Because I also that's question that's like, tricky. why do I like it? Just I'm not sure, like, because I train here, or is it because of all the, because just especially, like, it's high ceiling, bright, nice. It's cool because there's a buffer zone, a columnate outside. It makes sense, architecturally. But, yeah, it's just hard to know, like, did I like it because of what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also another example of a building uh, near here. Uh, our office block is called Post Building by mm -hmm. HMM, I think. Uh, they have a roof garden, mm -hmm. uh, and I think like they're supposed to like open it to the public or something. Uh, but then like the door is like very small that you need to, and there's like a small piece of paper saying like there's a public garden up there, but then like, like if you want to go in, you need to like scan all of your uh, stuff to go through. You cannot bring food or drinks up there. And those kind of things in there, kind of quickly, because, yeah. Yeah, the, there are places that pretend to be accessible or open to the public, but that put up so many barriers, even when they're not like hard barriers, but mental barriers that they know full well that the result is that not many people will go through all of them to get to to get there, and that's also intentional. George, you want to say something? I, I do. I think I have quite a bit to say, so I, I'm not sure if we're allowed to. You should to say it. And then keep, we can uh, have a conversation over drinks. We, yeah. <laughs> I think Manijay uh, yes. answered your question. <laughs> so maybe we'll <laughs> maybe we'll wrap up then. <laughs> Look at the institution kicking us out. I'm actually encouraging you to stay to continue a conversation that's not in this formal setting. <laughs> oh, <you're welcome. laughs> Um, okay, I guess, shall I exit? Yes, I think Do the uh, exit. And there, and we, there's drinks. Uh, thank you. There's drinks, and um, you can come up and talk to us and ask us questions in person, less without a microphone. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for um, your question, your generosity, and staying. And thank you, Yoris, so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone involved here with your questions. And thank you.